Hello. All right, there we go. Uh, good morning. Uh, and I'm Morgan, and this is Fear and Loathing on the Internet. Um, I have a standard disclaimer. I used to work for a very large company, uh, so none of the stuff that I've done here, with one exception, was actually done for them. Uh, this was actually all done generally in my spare time, all with the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Um, in a non standard move, I'm actually going to cover quite a lot of different case studies in brief. Uh, not all of this work was done by me exclusively, uh, so I'd like to thank the people I actually did it with uh, beforehand. Um, particularly Colin Anderson, Eva Galprin, Claudio Garnieri, Eric King, Bill Marchak, and John Scott Railton. So, this talk is in part um, about a dream. Um, I'd like to say that it's about a grand dream, uh, but in many ways it's about something that turned out to be far more adolescent. Um, it's a dream that I had uh, that really formed as a teenager. Um, and it was a dream about the internet. Um, so I sort of have an admission to make that I was actually indeed a teenage techno-utopian. Um, when I first got on the internet, I was amazed by the hitherto um, unseen communication potential that this new medium was going to provide. And I had high hopes that it would do really positive things for humanity. Uh, people would be able to understand each other in ways that they never had. It would give voice to the voiceless. And you know, it would act as a liberation technology. Um, now, that's not exactly where we are at the moment. We're sort of somewhere more like this. Um, now, I presume that a lot of people here will be familiar with the concept of the panopticon. Um, it's, it's a meditation on surveillance that was originally postulated by an English philosopher by the name of Jeremy Bentham. Um, and it was actually the design of a prison. The idea being that you would have a central room and all the prison cells would surround it. And from the central room, you'd be able to view the activities of anyone in the prison, and they wouldn't know whether or not someone was watching. In fact, they wouldn't even know if someone was in the room. And so this would actually function by having a calming, stifling effect on the behavior of potentially rowdy prisoners um, by making them aware that they could constantly be under surveillance. Um, now, obviously, there's parallels to a lot of the stuff that people have been discussing recently, um, largely pertaining to state surveillance. Um, so this, this talk is actually going to be about that. Um, it's it's going to cover a variety of case studies on the attempts to map mass surveillance and a bunch of case studies on the targeted surveillance of various activists and journalists that I've ended up working with. Um, we're going to discuss why this occurs, uh, the legal coercion mechanisms uh, behind this, and discuss a little bit about what I'd like to see happen. So, I, there's been a lot of discussion recently about mass surveillance. I presume that most people here have some idea of how it happens. However, I'm just going to briefly point out that the way internet traffic is generally collected um, is you have uh, devices, which are frequently known as massive intercept devices, that perform packet inspection um, at, at large internet junction points. Right, so they at places where significant amount of traffic passes, you have machines capable of performing analysis on very large amounts of traffic. Um, there's vendors, obviously, that produce and sell these machines. You guys may have heard of Naris. Um, there was some controversy around them, as it was postulated that they had actually sold uh, surveillance equipment to the Iranian regime. Um, there's another reason why you might have heard of them. Uh, there was an early NSA whistleblower, a man by the name of Mark Klein, and he worked for AT&T in San Francisco. Um, it was actually his job to install these machines and run fiber. Um, and he realized why he was doing this and what this was being used for, and he felt that this was unethical, and so he told the public about it. And what this was was the NSA was installing these machines Again, it's sort of like large internet service providers in order to you know, monitor and collect traffic in bulk. Um, we know a lot more about this now, thanks to Edward Snowden. Um, 
I wish he had released slides in high res, or that the people who'd made them were in high res, but you get the idea. Um, what you see here is um, X key score, or a map of X key score locations, which is one of the um, larger internet collection efforts that the Five Eyes have going on. Um, from what we know from a uh, Mark Klein, it's likely that they actually do use Naris boxes to perform this type of collection. And you can see from the dots all over the map that they're pretty prolific, as you would expect, from the world's best funded spy organization. Um, there's a lot of other people that provide this type of capability. Um, Amesis is one. This is not their actual logo. Um, I also did not add the editorialization myself. I found this while searching for their logo on the internet. And why might someone do this, you ask? Well, so Amesis provide this type of surveillance equipment, um, and it's been suggested that they were less than ethical in who they sold this to, um, and they were found providing it to the Libyan regime, um, which leads to accusations of them being complicit in torture. Uh, another vendor that sells this type of technology that you may have heard of is a Californian firm by the name of Bluecoat. Um, in 2011, uh, the hacktivist group Telecomics discovered that this gear was actually being used in Syria. Um, and they disclosed this to the public, and there was quite a, a big hue and cry about it. There was a large Wall Street Journal article, um, and sort of people really followed up what was going on, um, largely because Syria is actually embargoed by the United States, so it's actually illegal uh, for companies to provide products to them. Now, a little bit after that, it was postulated that this gear was actually being used in Saudi Arabia to facilitate surveillance over there. Um, and I actually remember thinking, why are we sort of working on rumors and speculation? Um, and because I'm a security engineer, I decided that the best idea would actually be to map the usage of these devices everywhere. Um, so I did. Um, and this is a map that I made of all the blue coat installations I could find. Um, this was in early 2013. Um, so to explain this, the blue is areas where we definitely found installations. The black was areas where we did not. The gray is areas where I found them and I decided that I didn't care. Um, and <laughs> I'll tell you why. Um, so it, it's actually best practice for the use of these technologies on corporate networks. Um, because people who are on those networks sign agreements, um, people have security policies and so forth, and so they block a lot of content. So in the gray was places where they were found, but they were just found to be used on corporate networks. Um, the blue, however, was where they were used on public access networks, ISPs, and that sort of thing. Um, places where people would expect to have free and open internet. Um, so this was published January 2013. There was a New York Times article. Um, and shortly after that, uh, the reseller that was found to be selling this gear to Syria was fined $2.8 million, um, which is kind of a good result, but is actually not a lot of money for a major international firm like Blueco. Um, we actually did another effort a little bit later and continued mapping for these devices. And when we rescanned the internet, we actually found that they, their devices were again being sold in Iran. Um, now, this is another country that is actually embargoed by the United States, so it's actually illegal for them to have sold it there. Um, now, Bluecoat actually said at the time, um, there was an article on page one of the Washington Post, and the Washington Post got Bluecoat on record saying, we do not design our products or condone their use to suppress human rights. Our products are not intended for surveillance purposes. Um, and I was sure that actually wasn't the case. So Blue Coat provides a product uh, that provides real-time awareness of your network. Um, so essentially what that does is it, um, it monitors traffic, it allows you to manipulate it or to block it or to log it. Um, so this could be very handy in a corporate environment where you want to stop people from getting access to Facebook. However, when it's used for whole countries at large junction points, it can also be useful for logging the actions of internet users. So as they said, they theorized that the products were not designed for surveillance purposes. I wasn't sure that was actually right. I was pretty sure that I'd actually read on the internet 
that they had actually advertised it as such. When I searched for it, however, I could not find this. Um, however, where the internet forgets, the Wayback Machine remembers. Um, and this is a talk that was given by Craig Hicks Fraser, the VP of Blue Coat Systems, uh, at um, a surveillance fair in Dubai in 2006 called Practical Examples of Lawful Intercept. Um, so, that appears to not be entirely accurate, but maybe it was a while ago, maybe they've forgotten. So, anyway, these types of concerns about mass surveillance are not new, and people have talked about it a lot. Um, what I'd actually like to focus on um, is a different kind of surveillance. Um, however, we actually would have thought we'd solve this problem some time ago. Um, people have been concerned about this since the 90s. There was a movement that some of you may have heard of called the Cypherpunks. Um, they were concerned with the free speech stifling possibilities of surveillance, um, and they advocated the use of strong encryption. Um, now, if you came from that movement, uh, you might go to sleep in the 90s and wake up now, and actually think for certain reasons that you'd won. Um, now, all of the world's major operating systems provide the possibilities for encryption, which is a good win. Uh, most of the world's major web services provide encrypted access to them, which also seems like a good idea. Um, the Tor project still exists. Not only still exists, is it's actually been affecting international events. Uh, it's used heavily during the Arab Spring to circumvent um, blocking and government censorship. However, surveillance has also evolved. Um, yes, it's in My Little Pony. Um, so, historically, the NSA was known to employ a football field of mathematicians that were charged for the purposes of breaking cryptographic ciphers and so forth. And recently, it's come out that the NSA's new code breakers, uh, a group of hackers known as the tailored access operations. Um, now, this is basically because it's actually easier to break into things and steal key materials than it is to break codes and ciphers. Um, they're not the only ones doing this. There's been a lot of documentations on the actions of the Chinese government. Uh, the counterpart there is the 3PLA. Uh, this happens much in the way that you would expect. Um, a target is identified, digital devices are broken into, um, an implant allowing further access is installed, and then you steal their data, you track their location, their communications, and so forth. Now, large companies, um, realizing that they're actually being targeted with this, have actually been reasonably unimpressed. This is the general counsel of Microsoft, who said that government snooping now constituted an advanced persistent threat. Um, and it's good that people are recognizing this. Um, however, the use of targeted technology for surveillance is actually, it's been around for a while. A lot of people here might remember this case. Uh, this is the Bundestrojana. Uh, so there was uh, someone that was being prosecuted for being part of a steroid sales ring. And it came out in his defense um, that they had discovered much of his activity uh, by virtue of the fact that it installed backdoor software on his computer, um, which they were using to monitor his communications. Um, the, his lawyers actually got hold of this evidence, and the CCC actually analyzed it and published um, an account of this. Um, at the time, it was sort of initially denied that this was being done. Um, but then it was found that actually as of 2011, when this case was, that the German government had actually already authorized uh, 52 such uh, uses of this technology. Um, a year later, the Dutch government decided that they wanted to legalize this sort of thing. In fact, they actually wanted to go further. They wanted to make it legal to target um, anyone, anywhere with this, be it inside the country or outside, and they also wanted to be able to do this so they could delete illegal content on remote computers. Um, a lot of people actually found this idea very worrying, um, and the law did not pass in its current form. Um, but as you can see, for uh, quite a few years, you know, there's been a lot of people sort of interested in having this type of capability, and where there is demand, people will create things, and they will sell them to you. Um, 
So I've sort of talked about, I'm going to talk about a lot about malware, which is, is generally the form that this type of lawful intercept surveillance takes. Um, now, I joke that malware is any software that gets installed on your computer without an end user license agreement. Um, however, functionally this takes the form of software that you don't know that you have on your computer that allows remote access. Um, now, the issue is, is that we've actually been talking about this sort of thing for years, and you know, sort of viruses were traditionally the sort of thing that, you know, ran on your friend's computer and it stopped it from working and they wanted you to fix it and it took days and that sort of thing. Um, let's just say this is a, a different type of beast. Um, the sale of offensive capability um, isn't particularly new. Um, there's a bunch of large American arms contractors that have been doing this for some time. Um, there's also a variety of boutique companies that also um, write this for people. Um, what it costs to break into computers um, is actually becoming reasonably understood. This is actually a two-year-old price list that was leaked. Um, but you can see that for an OS6 vulnerability, twenty to fifty thousand dollars. You know, Windows vulnerability, sixty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars. Chrome vulnerability or Internet Explorer, eighty to two hundred thousand, and so forth. So. The industry has actually started to do a bit of soul searching um, about the sale of this sort of thing. Um, this was an interesting piece on a, a mailing list, which is um, largely, largely people who come from the sort of offensive end of the industry, the security industry. And this guy, Justin Ferguson, said, what exactly do you think they do with the intel that they collect from such operations? Um, basically, if you sell someone an exploit that ends up being used to steal intel, that ends an extraordinary rendition or a car bomb strapped to the side of a scientist's car. Your hands are anything but bloodless and you have most certainly deployed bombs and guns unlike you speculate. But that's life, you know, we're all spooks now. <clears throat> so what actually happens out there in the really real world? I want to cover a few cases here. Um, uh, this is a woman named Alasha Hubby. Uh, she is a uh, Bahraini who lives in London. Uh, she works as an economics professor. Um, she's a founding member of the uh, activist organization Bahrain Watch. Now what Bahrain Watch does is they monitor the sale of arms um, to Bahrain. Uh, recently they had a campaign to stop the Korean government selling tear gas uh, to the Bahraini government to suppress protests. Um, so she actually sent this mail to her organization in the beginning of May 2012. Um, who says user education doesn't work? Guys, I think I've been hit with a targeted Trojan, Trojan on my laptop. Um, and it turned out that she had. Um, a reporter who was working with them ended up contacting me um, and I ended up helping her analyze the malware that was installed on her computer, the, the back door, trying to figure out who it was, what it was, what they were doing. Um, she was obviously quite worried because her husband was actually in prison in Bahrain. Um, now, it turned out that the software that was installed on her computer um, was software known as FinSpy. Um, people had actually been interested in this for a really long time. Uh, Miko, who gave a keynote with David Hasselhoff on the first day, um, said, this is what he said of the software, we know it exists, but we've never seen it. You can imagine a red diamond. Um, so people theorized about the software for a while um, before we discovered it on Alasha Habi's computer. Um, now, this is reasonably full-featured software. It's sold for the purposes of uh, it's a governmental-only intrusion suite for lawful interception, I think is what they call it. Now, this is what it does. Um, all sorts of things that someone who wants to monitor someone surreptitiously would find appealing, um, from recording your keystrokes to recording ambient audio around the computer's microphone, uh, obviously recording video through people's webcams, um, you can take screenshots, listen to their Skype conversations, and so forth. Um, there's a variety, works on a variety of operating systems, including mobile operating systems. Um, I analyzed samples for this for iOS, Android, Blackberry, Symbian, and Windows Mobile. Um, it provides interception of calls, logging of phone calls, obviously allows you to track the victim's location. Uh, the bit that actually made me really paranoid when I was doing this work uh, was it's got um, this basically invisible microphone technique. Um, 
when you analyze the code, it actually refers to itself as the spy call. So what happens is it instantiates an outbound call um, that you are unaware exists to a remote location. So it's just sort of ambiently recording all sound around your cell phone. Um, if an inbound call comes in, it returns control of the hardware to the phone, you know, buzz, buzz, phone flashes, ring, ring, you do your conversation, you shut down your call, and this continues again. This led to me peering suspiciously at my cell phone a lot. <clears throat> um, so we did some mapping to try to figure out where around the world this technology was being used. Um, and we found servers um, for this in a variety of different countries. Um, Ron talked a little bit about this yesterday in his black code talk. Um, there were some countries that gave us real pause for thought. Like this was found in uh, Turkmenistan on a range belonging to the Ministry of Communications. Um, Turkmenistan doesn't have the best human rights record, despite the era of infinite happiness that was recently declared there. Um, I know, who would have thought? Um, so we released a report on this on July 2012. Um, the New York Times posted this on page A1, which was useful because it actually meant that a group of people far crazier than hackers got involved, and that is investigative journalists. Um, and they managed to discover all sorts of interesting things about this company. Um, they had interesting offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands and various interesting business dealings, which I am, I'm not expert in this, but um, to, to the layperson, me, they, they seem suspicious indeed. Um, finally, the British government decided that this was potentially, they weren't entirely sure about this, um, and so they decided that they wanted to stop the sale of this technology to repressive regimes. Now, they didn't actually stipulate what constituted a repressive regime, so there was kind of a lot of wiggle room for them there. Um, but it was great that they actually said that they were going to do something. Um, there's a lawsuit happening in the UK. It was found that a um, British citizen um, was broken into by the Ethiopian government using the software. Um, he is trying to, su he wants the UK government to take international action over this. Um, there's actually an American uh, citizen who is also suing the Ethiopian government with the assistance of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, this software was found installed on his computer. Um, and he's an American citizen, so it appears that the Ethiopian government has been targeting um, people on US soil. Now, this specific form of lawful internet, uh, lawful intercept targeted surveillance software, actually came to notoriety um, during the Arab Spring. Um, during the revolution in Egypt, uh, people kicked down the doors of the state intelligence apparatus and found these documents inside. Um, Finfisher is a company in Munich um, that produces the FinSpy software. Um, now, these documents were found to State Security Investigation Department uh, from Gamma International. Description, remote intrusion solution, FinSpy. Um, for the princely sum of 287,000 euros. Uh, this might seem like real money, it is not. Uh, it is basically dictator pocket change. Um, now at the time, Gamma International did the, it wasn't me dance. Uh, they said, ah, we haven't supplied any of our FinFisher suite of products or related training to the Egyptian government. Um, the stipulation was that they had just engaged in a discussion about the potential sale of this stuff. A year later, they made an even more interesting statement. Uh, we did not supply any Finn Fisher products to Egypt that could have been used during the movement of the opposition. Now, I'm not entirely sure what that means. It feels to me that it's sort of deliberately confusing, perhaps the least untruthful thing they could have said about this situation. Um, so, over the last two years, um, the use of this technology has shown up at least seven times in Egypt, um, targeting Egyptians in Cairo and Riza. Um, this is a list of samples of the malware. Um, 
This is simply so people can understand that what I'm saying is not a story. This is reproducible with the right sort of eyes. So if anyone wants to take a picture, they can work on this later. Um, what I find concerning is, is that their initial denials um, in 2011 seem to imply that they had not sold this and would not sell this because the country was in a state of concerning turmoil. Um, given that this product has shown up in this country over the last couple of years, um, well, we know that the situation in Egypt is still tumultuous. So these guys are actually just an example of a booming new trade. Um, as I mentioned, where there is demand in capitalism, there is supply. Um, so this industry has gone from being worth nothing 10 years ago to uh, what was quoted as, I believe, about $5 billion a year in 2012. Um, what you see on the slide is an advertisement for what is commonly known as the wire tapper's ball. Um, this is ISS World. This happens in Washington, Dubai, um, Southeast Asia, around the world. And they sell all sorts of technologies for lawful interception, criminal investigations, and intelligence gatherings. Um, now, while many governments have actually uh, possessed this as a boutique capability, think the Five Eyes, Russia, France, probably Germany, and so forth. What's interesting now with this technology being sold on a, a semi-open market is, is that any government can buy it, uh, which is why you see this technology cropping up in Ethiopia, Bahrain, and so forth. Um, there's some activists in the United Arab Emirates uh, who are known as the UAE Five. Um, they were imprisoned for signing a pro-democracy petition. Um, this is a guy called Ahmed Mansour. Um, his exact crime, I believe, was something along the lines of insulting the ruling family by signing said petition. Um, and he was thrown in jail for a couple of years. Uh, when he got out, um, his political beliefs were largely unchanged, and he continued to expound them publicly. Um, as it turned out, the political beliefs of the ruling party um, well, the ruling faction in the UAE was also unchanged. Um, and he was being followed, and in many cases he was physically assaulted. He wasn't entirely sure how this was happening. Um, so I ended up being asked to analyze his computer. Um, and as it turned out, there was actually um, a surveillance software installed upon it. Um, now, this software is known as DaVinci. Uh, and it was sold by an Italian company called Hacking Team. Um, great name. Um, and they sell this as the hacking suite for governmental interception. Um, now, these guys pitched this as surveillance for the security aware geographically mobile target. Um, so the idea is, is that if you actually have someone that you want to surveil that's kind of paranoid, you don't know where they are and this sort of thing, this is, this is the stuff for you, right? They claim that it's stealth and untraceable, which is, I think, a slight exaggeration on their part. But, you know, still, it's a marketing pitch. Um, so, there was uh, an article in Bloomberg about this. Um, and initially, it was sort of denied that you know, the software had been sold to any you know, repressive governments and so forth. Um, however, it was actually found being used again uh, in Morocco. There's a citizen journalist group called Mamfakinch who is critical of the Moroccan government. Um, and they received awards for free expression um, from Global Voices. And actually, Google gave them an award for this as well. Um, and around that time, what happened was that being citizen journalists, they had a web page which said, if you have news, you know, please contact us here, and so forth. And someone sent them a message saying, I really can't be named. Uh, I'll get in a lot of trouble, um, but please read this attached document because it contains much scandalous information. Um, this was actually not a great idea. Um, but you know, being journalists, they actually looked at it, and um, the organization was actually compromised and surveilled by the Moroccan government. And I ended up helping them analyze the software and figuring out what went on. Um, 
And it was actually very concerning. They actually found that it actually had a, a very, very much the chilling effect um, on their work. Um, now, the, the targeting of journalists is actually of some concern. Uh, you're starting to see a pattern here of activists being targeted, journalists being targeted. Um, this software has been found all around the world. Um, most concerningly, we see it being used in sort of Central Asia, Africa, Middle East, and so forth. Um, but as I mentioned, the targets that we've seen sort of publicly are very interesting. Um, this is actually research that I did do for my former employer as part of my day job. Um, we took a sampling of the world's 25 largest news organizations, and we actually found that 21 of them had actually been targeted uh, by state attackers with this type of technology. Um, obviously, this is somewhat concerning. And it speaks to um, targeting journalists, not specifically for the information they provide, but access to their sources. Um, citizen journalists, large news organizations. Um, in this specific case, uh, there's a Vietnamese blog called An Basan. Uh, it was the largest political blog outside of Vietnam that was not under the control of the government. Um, early last year, they were hacked, and a reporter who was working on the case actually asked me to see if I could do anything. Um, at the time, <clears throat> this wasn't possible, um, but I continued sort of working with various people, and we actually began to see a, a pattern. Um, <clears throat> that was hacked early in 2013. Um, there's a Vietnamese uh, mathematician in Toulouse who did a bunch of constitutional writing about how he thought that the Vietnamese government <clears throat> should reform. Um, he was also targeted in May of 2013. Um, when things started getting even more interesting uh, was the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco uh, received an email uh, which actually showed good understanding of the target in that it offered activists free flights and hotels to attend a human rights conference. Um, <clears throat> Additionally, uh, I became aware of another case of the, a reporter who was based in Vietnam uh, who wrote for the Associated Press. Um, now, what's interesting is that the bloggers at the EFF that were targeted were only the people who had written on the Vietnamese government. Um, so it actually became apparent when I looked through all of this that these were actually all the same actors. Now, there's eight million Vietnamese in the diaspora that exist outside of the government. Um, and this appears to be the most common, cheap, and scalable method of actually trying to keep tabs on, on what people that are saying things the Vietnamese government doesn't like outside uh, of their domain of control. Um, unfortunately, just two days ago, uh, the founder of the An Basan blog that I mentioned uh, was actually imprisoned by the Vietnamese government for lowering the prestige of the state. Um, so this game is actually very, very real. Um, and it, it becomes even more concerning um, when there's actually a hot conflict in progress. Um, in the case of Syria, the civil unrest started around 2011. Um, and a digital campaign targeting opposition to the Syrian government uh, followed shortly afterwards. Um, Skype was very commonly used there because people don't trust the Syrian telecommunications establishment, um, which is probably not a bad move on their part. Um, the picture of the man you see there, uh, his name is Buran Galyun, and he was the head of the Syrian transnational opposition. Um, his Facebook page was hacked, and a link was posted explaining that the Syrian government was monitoring dissidents, and that in order to avoid this, you should actually install the following software, um, which will provide security for you on Facebook. Now, this is, this is not an official Facebook security download. Um, now, while tracking this, um, I actually found the website that they used to experiment with a variety of templates. 
uh, to target people. I'm not sure why they ended up on this one. Um, so this was the website, um, but I actually saw a variety of other attempts that they'd made, which was this one, uh, also this one. Um, so social media was actually very key in organizing and mobilization um, in Syria. Um, not just Facebook, but also YouTube. Due to the ban on foreign journalists, this was used to upload videos of the atrocities occurring in the country. Um, I was doing analysis on um, the targeting of an NGO group that was actually working with Syrian refugees. And unfortunately, a lot of the lures that are used to try to get people to install malicious content, uh, well, it's targeted surveillance software on their computers, um, because this is in a hot war, is frequently grisly. Um, it suggests that there's videos showing, you know, frequently violence against women by Assad soldiers. In this case, um, it suggested that this would show a human rights atrocity being um, done by Assad's thugs. So I analyzed this, I looked at the malware, um, I found that it was talking to uh, a dress basin belonging to the Syrian government, and then without thinking about it, for some reason I double clicked on the video. Um, and it showed a civilian having his throat cut and being pushed into a shallow grave. Um, so this, this is actually used for, you know, fairly serious purposes in very real situations. Um, the, the people that are being targeted, this, targeted by this stuff are very well studied by their adversaries. And actually the people who provide training are well understood too. Um, a lot of you guys have probably had security advice or even provided security advice and you tell people to use Tor or something similar like this. Um, this is a program that offers to provide protection from surveillance and censorship, uh, and it's a Persian language only tool. Um, now, there was a copy of this that was backdoored uh, that would install this tool, but also send all of your keystrokes to an address in Saudi Arabia. Um, probably undesirable. Um, this was a copy of Freegate, which again is a, a tool that offers to provide protection against government surveillance. Um, this is a modified version. It does install Freegate. It also installs other things that you do not want, which talk to the Syrian government. Um, Tor, I've, just, I've actually seen backdoor copies of as well. Um, it's very popular uh, with people trying to evade Chinese government surveillance. Um, this was a copy that did that, but also sent all of your uh, communications to the Chinese government. Um, so, well, as opposed to the obvious effects, this is actually also really depressing. Um, so I'm going to take a brief... Get it. So, of course, if you're actually in the right place <clears throat> and you have the right sort of authority, you don't actually have to do all of the stuff that we've just been describing, right? You can just ask people for what you want. It helps if you have a piece of paper which says that they have to give you the information that you want. Um, what's become very concerning is, is that this no longer simply takes the form of warrants for data, for user communications, for people's content, people's emails, and that sort of thing, which is traditionally what you'd expect law enforcement to ask for. Um, this now takes the form of legal demands to alter systems um, and so forth. Um, the BitLocker is Microsoft's encryption product that comes you know, on, on their modern operating systems. The head of BitLocker engineering uh, recently said to um, a news outlet that he was asked multiple times by the FBI to install a backdoor in it so that they could evade encryption. Um, People have probably heard of LavaBit. This was Edward Snowden's email provider. They did not simply ask for uh, them to give up a single email box. Uh, they asked for the keys that would have actually provided access to everyone's email, and they actually shut down uh, their mail service rather than comply. Skype used, Skype said in 2008 that 
because of the way Skype was architected, they wouldn't be able to comply with requests for user information even if they were asked. Um, this is no longer the case. Uh, there was an internal project at Skype known as Project Chess, uh, which was an effort designed to make Skype able to comply with law enforcement requests. Um, there's obviously been a bunch of legal challenges to these types of approach. Uh, the EFF has been suing the NSA for a really long time, um, varying degrees of success. Um, now, I thought about this, and this led me to postulate that as a service increases in popularity, the chances that someone would eventually force you to coerce the security model approaches a total. And I thought maybe this is actually a bit of a hard sell, you know? Like, can I actually convince people of this? And then you started getting headlines like that. The NSA and the CIA spied on people in online gaming. With the release of this, there was actually a 70 page document, which I read all of, um, <laughs> that contains such gems as this. This is the NSA describing the efforts of the British intelligence services. The GCHQ has vigorous its efforts to exploit game and virtual environments and has produced exploitation modules in Xbox Live and World of Warcraft. So what they're basically saying is, you know, this is thoroughly good. Come on guys, we can't be left behind. We've got to get in on this. Um, so basically like where there is users, there actually will be surveillance effort. Um, now I think there's a variety of ways that we can actually start engineering um, against this. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail, but historically when you actually talked about this sort of thing, you sounded, you know, a little bit crazy. Um, however, what I want to point out is, is that there's actually some core systems that are actually created like this by default. Um, DNSSEC, so DNS being the, one of the core protocols that runs the internet. Um, the key for this is actually split between seven people in seven different countries around the world, being the US, Burkina Faso, Trinidad and Tobago, Canada, China and the Czech Republic. Um, the idea being that this type of coercion is an inevitability, so you'd actually have to coerce at least four people in four different countries in order to force them to compromise the system. Um, I'm going to leave time for questions. Um, however, what I want to say is that you might remember in the early 2000s there was actually a really big push to get major service providers to provide encrypted logins. You know, um, I think Gmail did it, and then Facebook followed, and then Outlook. And I think finally Yahoo actually said, yes, we're going to provide encrypted logins to their service. Um, and everyone celebrated and they were like, yay, we won, we pressured all these big companies to do this. Um, these celebrations were somewhat premature. Um, I'm not talking about this, um, although if you worked at the company at the time, it kind of felt a little bit more like that. Um, now, what I was referring to there is the, the efforts of the NSA to tap um, into data center links between um, Google's, Google's data centers. No, what I'm actually talking about is this, which might actually be something that you've seen before. Um, so this is a diagram of how communications happen on the internet. Much simplified, I've removed most of the series of tubes. Um, but on one side you see someone logging in to their webmail, sending an email, and the other side someone logs into the email and receives it. Um, and so we got encryption here and encryption over here and of course everything that happens in the middle is still essentially free and open. Um, and that's kind of a big problem. Um, so there's been sort of a bunch of efforts to uh, fix this, uh, one of which is sort of opportunistic encryption, uh, start TLS. Um, unfortunately, when I looked at this after the Snowden revelations, revelations came out last year, of the 20 biggest email providers in the world, only five provided this and only two did it correctly. Um, when I last looked, things were better, but not by much. Um, now, thinking about this, the biggest three mail providers in the world between them service one billion users. That's actually quite a lot of people. Um, now, 
if they actually all did this, then that would actually be, be good. It would, it would fix a lot of the problems that people have discussed with sort of dragnet surveillance and bulk collection. Um, the bad thing would be is, is that it would actually still be possible to sort of target people via their email, um, but they wouldn't get everyone's. However, longer term, if these organizations decided that they wanted to uh, do encrypted tunnels between them where they actually agreed what this would look like, uh, then they could actually provide real security for a billion users. Uh, and I think that would be pretty cool. Um, so, basically, I want to finish by saying that the engineering against the coercion of your security model is actually something that we have to do now in order to protect the users. And we actually have a lot of tools, um, and we can actually do this, provided that people are properly motivated. Uh, maybe I'm still an idealist. Uh, maybe I'm still, as I said at the beginning, you know, a teenage techno-utopian. Um, but I think it's important to keep dreaming big and impossible dreams, which is why we're actually <clears throat> here at a place like Republica. Uh, so thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? I mean... Hi. Did I catch you correctly that you are now uh, advocating for using TLS as a measure in the, uh, um, to get towards coercion resistant so, whatever, uh, what was the title? So, of the I mean, I didn't get deep into the details. What, what's a good idea is start TLS. In fact, um, so, so TLS is sort of transport layer security, so it provides encryption, you know, between um, point A and point B on the internet. Um, Start TLS provides opportunistic encryption. So that actually means that, <clears throat> say, you know, your mail provider A, you can actually ask mail provider B, hey, do you support this? And if they do, you just encrypt stuff to them. If they don't, you still send it. Um, now, <clears throat> someone recently said, and I quite like this, that Sending mail to a mail provider that does not support Start TLS is like CCing the NSA. <laughs> yeah, but um, hi. Yeah, yeah, but the mail is still unencrypted uh, on each of the endpoints, which is uh, the bigger problem because Microsoft, being a United States company, for example, is not exempt from United States NSA. Um, going to court or some, doing something like that. We do have something like that in Germany, for example. There was a big marketing hoo-ha-ha -ha last year that some German mail providers were now using TLS for all their connections within each other, which of course doesn't solve the problem at all because all the interested authorities still have access. What you really want to do is end-to-end -end encryption that is not dependent on any of the providers. I agree. End-to-end -end encryption is a fantastic idea. The great thing about Start TLS is that it's, it's... So you said not solving the problem. Where I would disagree with you is I think it's a set of problems, right? So if your data is not encrypted at rest, then the issue is that someone can come for it with the bit of paper I described. Um, that's unfortunate. End-to-end um, -end encryption currently is a little bit tricky, especially with mail. Um, the, the gold standard for this at the moment is PGP. Training everyone to use it is hard. Um, I do. Sounds like you do as well. Um, I've tried to get some of my less technical associates, friends, and family to use it. It's been a struggle. Um, the reason why I advocate Start TLS is simply because um, it fixes... Uh, there we go. That specific problem. Um, which is essentially that all of that stuff is actually free. That stuff stops being free, and that means they actually have to come for it with a bit of paper, which is better than it being free, because that means that there's records of it. Is the theory anyway, depending on how cynical you are. <laughs> Isn't, um, great talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, isn't it also the case, um, his point is, is sort of discussing is the problem of centralization. I mean, Google, Google is a prism partner, 
And so using start TLS doesn't change the fact that they're collaborating motherfuckers. And it also doesn't change the fact that once you're in the cloud, Google's also owned inside and out by the NSA. Sorry to say it. But that's, that's the case. So start TLS doesn't really help because level three, the transit provider that provides the backbone, gets this. And because of the centralization, the way selector surveillance works is that they just look for a domain name. And then anything that matches the domain name immediately goes into a database. And people don't really understand that even if it does require some paperwork, it's not very much. So shouldn't we actually recognize that the paperwork goes between a bunch of spies and that that doesn't really stop anybody? And that since you know, the end-to-end -end encryption, even with uh, you know, how difficult it is, is the goal we want to reach, but it must also be in a decentralized fashion. It's not just about using PGP, it's about re-architecting the way that we communicate to remove people or corporations like Google and Yahoo from the picture entirely so that they can't be a centralized, risky place where these types of things can happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, there's quite a lot to address there, but I think that decentralized is definitely safer. Um, the paperwork on this has shown to be shady in all sorts of ways that we could never have predicted. Um, I think, you know, single Pfizer orders for you know, millions of user records uh, that persist across years and that sort of thing. Um, I, I advocate that individuals uh, do end-to-end -end encryption um, when they can. Um, it's easy for people to screw up. Um, the reason why I sort of, now, I seem to remember there was a talk, I think on day one, called Let's Talk About PGP, um, that uh, advocated the use of encryption as some sort of prophylactic. Um, now, I think of this as sort of a first layer. Um, you might want a double bag, as it were. Um, so, uh, this would allow, so I mean, obviously, start TLS plus PGP is obviously even better. Um, I mean, again, what this solves is it solves a problem of this stuff being free, right? It solves the problem of, you know, all right, where's the slide with the encrypt all the things, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it basically solves the problem of the fact that when you send uh, unencrypted email across li uh, links that are subject to bulk harvesting, um, that that has gotten for free. Um, yes, there are other ways to get the data. Um, this is sort of one of the easiest methods that we can actually probably force large companies to do. Um, as I know you're aware, uh, getting large companies to institute end-to-end -end encryption has not succeeded anywhere yet. But I think you're essentially right in, in the solutions you suggest. Um, anyone else? So it's been said that mass surveillance is now possible because the internet has made collecting lots of information on people very cheap. And so, you know, the NSA with its admittedly massive budget can use that budget very effectively to surveil lots of people. Um, and it seems like things like Start TLS increase the cost of mass surveillance. Um, but I'm curious if you know if there's been any analysis or if you have any notion of like exactly how far we need to go to make mass surveillance too expensive to bother. Right, so you've kind of hit, hit the nail on the head, which is the sort of, um, it seems like this increases the cost of surveillance. And I mean, that's, that's essentially what you're actually gonna do, because I mean, there, there's, there's a sort of security firm that makes this, their slogan is basically, you know, you don't have a malware problem, you have an adversary problem. Um, so, if you happen to have an exceptionally large government that is very dedicated to spying on you, um, in some ways the question is how expensive you make it for them. Um, I think, so obviously when it comes to targets, that depends on how interesting a target is. And your question is you know, how expensive do we have to make mass surveillance? Um, the, the model that, um, it's sort of come out that the, the Five Eyes was using is, is that you know, we'll just collect everything and sift through it later for the data that you want. Um, I think people will still go after the data that 
they want. However, if you actually start encrypting everything, um, then it means that a lot of the stuff that you collect is not immediately useful, depending on people's abilities to you know, read crypto later and that sort of thing. Um, so as to sort of how expensive, unfortunately I can't provide you with a dollar figure because I'm not entirely aware how, how deep these guys' pockets go. Um, but I think more expensive than functionally free is, is a really good start. So one more question, perhaps? No. Oh, where? Just stand up. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about how to solve the internet encryption problem, but basically the internet, though I love it, is fundamentally fucked as far as encryption is concerned because we've been building off of fundamentally unsecure systems for the longest time. In order to solve this problem, you have to build another internet. And that is not cheap, and that is not easy. But it is probably the most effective way to secure the internet if you have other, if you have major corporations that have not partnered or are not using the same type of internet services. What do you think? What was the, what the question? Um, the question is, do you believe that we can stably, we can actually secure the internet as it exists today? Well, <laughs> secure seems like, you know, can we secure something? It kind of sounds like a, the presentation of a potentially false binary, uh, right? Like, can I make this secure? Yes, no. I mean, the problem is, is that like, you know, everything is written in software and software is shitty. Um, so, I don't know. Can we secure the internet? From who and for what would be my, my response to you. Um, building a whole new internet seems kind of fatalistic. <laughs> um, I kind of like the one we've got, or at least the cat pictures part of it. Um, so, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'd certainly like to see your design for a decentralized new internet though, or a different model. It's an interesting idea. <laughs> I'm sure the resources are there. I hope you're right. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs>